Hello and welcome to this seminar podcast about approaching the exams and the exams process. The idea behind this podcast is to sort of tease out what it is that you do, what it is that many students do in and around exam time, in order to identify which behaviours in our sort of typical routines around exams are effective, as well as spotting any behaviours that might be ineffective or, or sort of getting in your way. The whole idea here is to consider everything you do around an exam as a sort of a ritual and like all rituals they, they serve a purpose of mentally preparing us in order to achieve a certain state of mind. In, in, in exams the, the state of mind is ideally your, your peak performance state, the one in which you are sort of thinking most clearly, able to remember everything you want to remember. And usually we've developed the exam routines that we have because we find they work, because they, we find they help us get as close as we can to that ideal state and, and through repetition and association we tend to get a little bit better at doing it all the time. Um, now you may already have your exam routines and rituals in which case we might just be exploring things you already do and asking why do they work but if you don't or if you feel you're in room for improvement in your exam routines I'll be hoping to suggest one or two new things you might want to consider to adopt may seem a little bit late to be doing that now, but it's never too late to get a bit better at what you do. So without let's much further ado, let's, let's kind of look ahead now to how it is that you are going to prepare for the exam and what it is you're going to do um, on the, the, sort of the day of the exam itself. Before you start listening to me talking about what you should be doing or could be doing to prepare for the exam, I want you to take a moment to just pause and reflect on how you already prepare for your exams. Now, be careful when you consider what exactly exam preparation is. Exam preparation is more than just memorizing facts. Essentially, exam preparation refers to everything you do in the sort of 24 hours or so before the exam, mentally, physically, emotionally, to prepare you. So. What I want you to do now is I want you to pause the recording and I want you to think back to the last exam you took or the last few exam you took and consider all the things that you do in preparation for an exam and maybe consider why it is, for each one consider why it is you do that. If there's no reason, if it's just habit or superstition, put that down, but pause for a moment to think even before it became habit, was there a reason you originally started doing it that way? or the reason that you keep doing it that way. The idea here is to try and tease out any underlying beliefs you have about yourself, uh, about how your memory works, about how performance in an exam works, so that we can then explore whether or not your beliefs about those things are correct and whether or not they match up with what research in psychology has found to, uh, to actually be the case when studying how students perform in exams. So pause the recording, think about the last few exams you've taken, what you did to prepare this for the day before, everything you did, and then when you're ready, play the recording again and we'll explore what the research has found to actually make a difference when it comes to exam preparation. Okay, hopefully at this point you've had a think about your last exams. If not, pause it again, finish thinking about them, how you prepare for them. But if you've done that, let's move on now to see what the research tells us actually makes a difference in terms of exam preparation. One of the often overlooked or misunderstood elements of exam preparation is essentially how much sleep you get. Now, some of that is going to be connected to whether or not you're ready for the exam, whether or not you're doing last minute preparations or getting up early in the morning to gather all your bits together. And so one thing you want to ensure is that you're not rushing around on the day of the exam having to get up early in order to do last minute preparations. You want to get all of that out of the way the day before. You want to get all your supplies ready, everything you're going to need to exam, all your bits and money for the bus or whatever, all in a one place ready to go so that effectively like a somebody jumping out of a plane, you've got your parachute there waiting at the door, you just grab it and go. But even if you do this, there still then is the question about, well, how much sleep do you need? And surprisingly, quite a lot of students operate on the misconception that it's actually better for them not to get a lot of sleep, or rather that time spent sleeping is, is time wasted. That uh, the best way to prepare for exam is to 
study very late into the night, the day before the exam, going over and over the material, and that essentially this is not only a more effective use of the time, but that they often view the time spent sleeping as dangerous time when things are forgotten, so less time sleeping means less risk of forgetting. Now, I've seen this belief repeated and, and reiterated amongst students that existed in my time as an undergraduate, and it's a completely broken idea about how memory works. In fact, it's almost the opposite in the way that memory works. Um, there are a good number of reasons why this kind of late night study the night before an exam, or even some students try to pull an all-nighter where they study all night before an exam, is actually going to make things much worse uh, on the, uh, the day of the exam. So let's explore why that is. Firstly, if you don't sort of at some point in the evening before stop studying and allow yourself to unwind, a number of things are going to happen. Firstly, you can keep studying, but you'll actually get less and less done and less and less effective study done. It's diminishing returns so that you could study all night, but chances are you won't learn a lot more than you would have learned if you just studied for the first hour or so and then went to bed. So you're spending the time and not achieving much, even though you might be going through the motions of studying. Furthermore, the stress in not getting sleep and continually worrying about the exam is actually going to result in disturbed sleep, if you try to have any, unless you give yourself a bit of unwinding time where you take a break, read a book, watch some television before you go to bed, because you want the sleep you have to be undisturbed, restful sleep. It will have the, the best kind of effect on you the following day. Um, when you actually look at the sleep studies and their effect on things like memory and exam performance, time and again we see that sleep improves memory, makes you more likely to remember things the following day, not less likely, and um, that in fact the idea of maybe getting less sleep, uh, you know, a, a brief sort of power nap, a couple of hours, is actually no better than not sleeping at all, which means again your memory is bad and you're underperforming. And it also seems to be that sleep not only sort of ensures good cognitive performance, we remember things, we can think clearly, we can make decisions, but also sleep seems to be an important way in which we manage our stress. That effectively something that's stressing you on one day, if you go and have a good night's sleep, is likely to stress you less on the following day. And This is so relevant to exams, it's, it's, it's blindingly obvious that exam stress is something you don't want to be at its highest level in the exam because that will cause you to underperform. But if you don't get some decent sleep you won't have processed that stress, you won't have managed it emotionally. Uh, whereas the person who has got sleep will have processed the stress better and be less stressed in the exam. And that ensures better performance in the exam itself. So the rule is very simple here. Study up to a point, yes, but then give yourself some time to unwind and get a good night's sleep. Six, eight hours, whatever your normal healthy amount of sleep is, get that the night before the exam and you will see the benefits on the day of the exam itself. But that's just the start. Let's, let's keep moving on here. We've talked about the night before, but what about the day itself? Well, there's sort of two areas where the research shows us we can be doing things that are productive on the day of the exam before we get into the exam hall itself. One is to do with our energy levels, and the other is to do with our stress levels. We want the first one high, we want the second one low. Now, the best way to manage our energy levels is through our diet. Um, mental activities tend to burn glucose, which are the sugars in our body rather than fats. So essentially, it's your, your sugar reserves and your glucose reserves that are going to be um, things that you, you're relying on in an intense mental activity like an exam. Now, you will find sugars in a lot of things. People often take energy drinks or chocolate bars and things into the exams, but these are sort of tend to be fast-release sugars. But you can also get sugars in anything with carbohydrates in it. And carbohydrates tend to be slower release sugars, so they're good for long endurance mental activities. As such, you want grains, breads, cereals, things like this in the morning so that you uh, can maintain a constant level of energy throughout the exam. And the longer the exam, the more endurance you've got. By all means, do bring in some sugars to the exam itself, sugar drinks or uh, sort of chocolate or something else that'll give you a bit of a boost if your energy levels begin dropping in the exam. But 
you have to lay a good foundation with a decent breakfast with some carbs in it. Now, once you've had your breakfast, the next thing you want to do is to sort of make sure that you manage your stress on the day. Stress is not always your enemy. A certain amount of stress is healthy. It will push you to higher levels of performance than no stress at all, but too much stress and performance begins to go down again. So you want to kind of get to that sweet spot, optimum level of a little bit of stress, but not too much. Now, things that will overstress you are problems like worrying about getting to the exam in time, so you want to ensure that you leave early so that no matter what the traffic's like, no matter whether the bus turns up or not, or your friend is um, five, ten minutes late picking you up in their car, that this isn't going to be an issue of you then getting to the exam in time or not. You want to arrive early so that any travel problems are irrelevant and your stress levels are not really high by the time you get to the exam hall because you were worried about getting there on time. Um, now, once you get to the exam hall, you need to make sure that you sort of don't stress yourself out. And there's a number of ways which you can do that. One of which is by sort of um, worrying about what everybody else is doing, you know, comparing your study strategies at this late stage to somebody else's and then worrying if you've done it right or if they've done it right. So essentially, you want to maintain high confidence and you do this by focusing on what you've done, don't compare notes or strategies at this late stage with somebody else, whatever they've done, you can't change at this point, so any comparison can, is usually only going to serve to make you worry if you find they've done something slightly different. Focus on what you've done, don't focus on what you've not done. Um, this is a, a strategy used by elite performers in a lot of areas like sport, they focus on what they want to achieve, they don't focus on the mistakes they're hoping to avoid, focus on the positive let the negative take care of itself. Now, this will help. It'll help avoid elevating your stress, but what if you want to kind of even reduce your stress a bit? You feel you're already a bit overstressed. Well, there's a number of ways you can manage your own stress levels through relaxation and self-talk. Uh, relaxation, this means just finding something that isn't exam-related for 10 minutes to take you out of yourself. Music for some people, reading something, watching something on online or just going for a walk, some kind of exercise, whatever helps you take your mind off what you're doing and distract you is good. Now self-talk is something again elite performers use where they literally talk to themselves and again tell themselves what they're going to do. Uh, again a bit like focusing on the positive, you talk to yourself about what you're going to do. You don't talk to yourself about what you want to avoid or what you're worried about. Um, now the thing is, if you can use these methods, relaxation and self-talk, they've been found to very consistently make a difference in terms of managing stress, and stress is always a factor in performance, so the better you manage it, the better chance you have of achieving your, your optimum performance level. At this point, we're actually in the exam itself. Now, hopefully if you've followed my advice, you've had a good night's sleep, you've had a decent breakfast, you're managing your stress so that you're still worried, that's, you're a human being in an exam, it's going to stress you a bit, but that you're not overstressed. But now you're in the exam, what can you do? Well, one area where you can make a big difference in terms of your exam performance is your time management. Um, there's a persistent problem of students using ineffective time management. They spend too much time on one question, they run out of time on the other questions, and they then get sort of great mark on one, rubbish mark on the other, and their overall mark is poor. What can we do? What can you do? Well, first things first, you look at the number of questions you've got, you look at the number of time you've got, out of time you've got, and you divide the questions into the time. Now, if all the questions are worth the same, they all get an equal amount of time. If there's one question which is worth twice as much as another question, it gets twice as much time. That's Use that kind of mathematics to figure out how much time each question gets. But most commonly, you have the same number of quotes. All questions are worth an equal value, so all get equal amount of time. You need to stick to that rule religiously. Absolutely ruthlessly. You cannot break that rule of starting to steal time from one question and give it to another. No matter how much you might think, well, question one is my good question. I want to spend more time on that to get the best possible mark. And question two is my weak question. Uh, I'm never going to get a good mark there. 
forget about that. The truth is that most of the time, no matter how, what there is, your good question or your bad question, the first, say, half of the time period you spend on any question, however much time that is, is when you do your best work. It's when you've got your thinking most clearly, you start with your strong points, everybody sort of leads with their, their strongest material. And when you get to about the halfway point of however much time you set aside for that question, the quality of what you're writing starts to diminish. It starts to go down, it's depending on how well you've prepared, it might go down a little bit or it might go down a lot. But generally speaking, as you go on spending more and more time on a question, it's diminishing returns. The quality of what you're writing gets lower and lower because it's weaker material. If it were a stronger material, you would have led with it earlier on. Until you get to the point where what you're writing is not very good. Now, to continue writing at that point where you're writing fairly low quality material is a very inefficient use of your time. And it's even worse if you're writing at that inefficient level and stealing time from another question which means you could be stealing time from the good part of that other question, that first half of the other question where you're writing best material. This is why you should never sort of add on extra time to answering a question because you're adding it on at the wrong end. You're adding it on at the end where you're writing low quality material. Better to just call it a day, cut off at the point where the time for that question runs out, accept that no matter how much extra you write, you're probably not going to change your mark much beyond that point and move on. And then you're then writing the next question and writing your best material on that question, which is nearly always going to be better material than the, the lowest quality material on the previous question. Even if it's not a good question, it's still better than the low quality material on the previous question. As well as making sure that you equally divide your time and manage it absolutely ruthlessly so that you don't steal time from one question to answer another, you make sure you never leave early you'll need all the time you've got allocated to the exam. And if you start walking away early, it's essentially throwing away time you should be using, and no matter how much you feel. Oh, I don't know what to say. I'm, I've run out of things to say. Um, I'm never going to do well in this. I might as well just chuck in the towel. Some of that is panic. Some of that is insecurity. Chances are, if you do literally run into a brick wall where you think, I've run out of things to say, I might as well leave now. Just pause for a minute, sit there, two or three minutes, doing nothing. And after the panic passes, because we, we are panicking when we think we run out of things to say most of the time, after the panic passes, you may look back at the question and realise, actually, there are other things you could say. We know this is true, because how often have we had that experience of walking out of an exam, at which point our stress levels go way down, and suddenly we think, oh damn, I could have said this, I could have said that. And if we'd simply waited in the exam hall, relaxed a bit and let our exam levels, stress levels drop there, we could have had these extra ideas there where we could have done something with them. So, never leave an exam early. The other thing you should do is to ensure that you um, set aside a certain amount of time for each question to both plan the question and review it. So however much time you've got for a question, Try to set aside a small amount at the start and a small amount at the end. You need the time at the start because you don't want to simply launch into writing a question. If you do that, a few things will happen. Firstly, your question will be a kind of flow of consciousness which has no particular structure, just comes out, the ideas pop into your head whatever order they pop into, and as such it's hard for your reader to follow. And also, as you start writing, some of the ideas you have for later on in the answer will get crowded out of the way by you focusing on the first things. And by the time you get to writing those later points, you'll have forgotten them because the, all that thinking on those first points will have gotten in the way of your memory of those later points. What you want to do is to write out all the points you're going to make at the very start, just in very bullet point form on a piece of rough work page, so that when you get halfway through the question you start forgetting the later points you were going to make, you can go back to that list of points and see, oh yeah, now I know I was going to say this, I was going to say that. But it also allows you to look at those points and think, what order am I going to do these in, and actually plan it a bit. We tend to plan our coursework essays very well, but we don't tend to plan our, our exam essays very well, and this is a mistake. Exam essays would benefit from a little bit of planning just as much as coursework essays would, so create your rough outline first too, as a memory aid and as a planning aid. Then at the very end, 
leave yourself a little bit of time to review and write a conclusion. Some students keep writing right up to the buzzer. They, they wait until the time literally runs out and finish off and halfway through a sentence, which means their essays never end. They don't have a conclusion. And an essay without a conclusion is a, is a flawed thing. So get to the point where you've sort of only a few minutes left and can finish up the point you're on and then use that last few minutes to write a conclusion where you review what you've written, mentally speaking, and then try to write a point which essentially sums it up. Not simply repeats the points you've already made, but offers a little bit of insight. And in doing that, you turn what could have been a list of points into an answer. And it will make your answer stronger if you can do that. Um, now, these are generally good points. They, they work for almost everybody. But uh, there are some more individual things you can do in an exam, which I've, I've listed here on the slide as well. This, I've seen very interesting things people do in exams. Uh, some people have told me they bring in earplugs. It's a great idea when you think about it, because in an exam you do want to shut out the world and the scribbling around you and the person behind you has got a, a bad cough or a sniffly nose. I know some people who bring in um, a clock because they find it's easier to keep track of the time they're working on an individual question. So there'll usually be a clock in the room, but one on your desk is something you can glance at quicker without sort of having to look up and lose tr track of where you are on the page. For some people, they bring in a mascot. You know, they always wear a certain shirt or there's a little teddy that sits on their desk. I mean, okay, this is superstition. But even if it is superstition and ritual, the fact that these people believe it works creates a connection in their mind between having the mascot, having the earplugs in, having the little clock on their desk, and getting into that mindset. And whatever it does, if it helps you get into that mindset through association, through repetition, then you should do it. And to hell with what anybody else thinks. I think that's about as much exam advice as any one person can absorb in one go, so I'm going to leave it there for talking about the exam, but there's, there's one more point I want to make before this podcast is over. Before we make the point, consider this thought exercise. Imagine, if you will, that um, uh, someone taps you on the shoulder, a mysterious traveller who has a, a magical machine that will travel back in time, and they can bring you back to meet yourself on the first day of your, your university studies. Now. You can't tell yourself the winning lottery numbers or, you know, invest in this or buy these shares. All you can do is pass on advice about your studies. Think about it. What would you tell yourself? What advice would you pass on? Now, having been through what you've been through and looking back with the benefit of hindsight, what could you tell yourself that would make your experience a better one, more productive, less stressful, more enjoyable, whatever benefit that might be? So I want you to pause the recording, have a think about what you would say, make a note or two even of the sort of the secrets you would pass on to yourself, the tricks of the trade you would pass on that you've now learned since you started university. Okay, pause the recording and think about it. All right, hopefully you've had the chance to think about it and now know that if you ever go drop back in time what you're going to tell your, your earlier self that will help you with your studies. What's the point of the exercise? The point I'm trying to make here is that there's a number of ways you can look at education. A lot of people uh, have the view, incorrect in my opinion, that education is about the accumulation of knowledge or skills or facts. That essentially you're like a stamp collector, you know, a fact collector, or a skill collector, who's just filling up this mental catalogue full of things or tricks or skills. But other people, and including myself here, they don't see education that light at all. For, for them, education is about growing, it's about changing. It's sometimes known as transformation, turning from one thing into another. And usually, without even realising it, as we learn, we grow, we change. Um, and the purpose of the thought exercise that I asked you to do with the, this kind of ma magical time traveller is to show you that without realising it, you have learned a lot of things, you have grown and changed a lot in the last few years. And that actually what you're able to pass back to your, your younger self 
is not just a couple of tricks of the trade that you've learned, but is is the wisdom, the accumulated wisdom of several years, and that you would probably find you're quite a different person than you were then, and that some of the things that you have gained in your studies are not things you can hand over to your earlier self, because they're not facts or tricks or, or techniques or tips. They're changes in who you are in terms of patience, in terms of motivation, in terms of determination or energy or or insight. I think the amount of things you couldn't pass back probably exceeds the amount of things you could. And those things you can't pass back represent ways in which you have changed. And these are not changes you can simply hand to somebody else on a plate. And the reason I think this is an important exercise is because sometimes this change and transformation is so gradual we overlook it, we don't realise it's even happened, but it's there. And you should recognise that in yourself and that effectively you have gained an awful lot more from your studies maybe than you fully appreciate. But that in time you will realise how much the experience has transformed you and how beneficial that transformation will be for you in the long run. Thanks very much for listening. I hope you found this useful. If it has raised any questions for you about exams or your time here at university, I'd recommend you have a chat with your tutor about it. All that remains for me to say is to wish you the best of luck in your remaining studies, and uh, I hope to see you all in graduation.